Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Bible class. I'm sorry that uh, for the confusion, we have our regular teacher out. So we'll start combined classes in here next week talking about our Visualized Bible Study series, something that you can share with your friends and neighbors. Uh, we have three copies of it. We'll get more if more, more demand is there, certainly. The problem is, if you're watching us from home, if you're live streaming now, are we already live streaming? I presume so, yes. Uh, unfortunately, it is copyrighted, and they've been specific to say, please don't upload this to the Internet. So we will be probably rerunning some old class sessions for that time, so you do have some spiritual food for Bible class time online, but we cannot share that particular series uh, by uploading it to YouTube that uh, is specifically, they specifically asked us not to do that because of their copyright. They want it, uh, they want churches to see it with one another, but they do not want it out on the internet. They, they, they have worked very hard, but invested heavily in preparing these lessons. So uh, they have every right to make that request and we've got to honor that. But we're here in Matthew chapter 26 in my class, and many of you were with Ronnie last week and discussed the Lord's Supper, um, but you may not have covered my questions about it. We'll begin there in just a moment, but let's have a word of prayer as we start. Our Father in heaven, be with us as we open your word. To help us to open our hearts and listen to you. Be with those we love. With those who are traveling, like John Cassidy and his family, be with Darla and Stacy Gladden as they travel. But Lord, be especially with those families in Uvalde who've lost their children, lost the, the teachers there. Be with our nation and help us find a way past all of this evil. Lord, we trust in you. We know that all things are in your hands. But be with us and comfort those who need it in a way only you can. Thank you for those who've given their lives in service to our country this Memorial Day. Please help us to be worthy of that sacrifice and of the sacrifice of your son. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen. So, Matthew chapter 26, but before we get into this, I had a couple of brief questions for you. Number one is, what was the longest night of your life? You ever had a really long night when a child was being born, perhaps, or when you're waiting up for a teenager to show up back home, uh, whenever you had to make a job change? Maybe when you knew a layoff was coming and you didn't have very many whiskers down at the job, the way my brother would say it, on the railroad. I know he had a few sleepless nights when the layoffs were coming. Have you ever had one of those nights? What was your night like? Yes? Once a teenager did not come home. Yeah. Oh. Every 15 minutes I turned on an extra light. When he did come home, it was a blaze. <laughs> so. Well, Margaret made her point. Every 15 minutes that her son was, her son was late, a teenager did not, was not coming home, was not there on time, for every 15 minutes she turned on another light. And by the time he got home, the whole house was ablaze with light. <laughs> I'll never forget a call from my father. I'd forgotten about this until we talked about this. Uh, from my father to uh, Rudy Legazzo's house that he had rented. He was a... Uh, a young man in the service, and he was going to be off the next day, and we were, in the summertime, we were playing um, Risk. If you ever played Risk, you know that could go on for hours and hours and hours, and it had, and my dad uh, lost his patience at 3 a.m. <laughs> and said, I know you didn't have a cur curfew, but this is ridiculous. Get home. And so we didn't finish that game. Aren't those horrible nights? Yeah. Don't you hate that anticipation? And sometimes you know something's coming and you can't do anything about it. That's awful. That's awful. Of course, our Lord had that kind of a night 
in Gethsemane. Um, when did you really disappoint yourself? Maybe in high school or another time, but I know we all disappointed ourselves sometime in high school. I had an, oppor had an opportunity to be on a Bible Bowl team, and a friend talked to me. It was at a particular time early in the afternoon, and a friend talked to me at going out at dawn and going and picking watermelons. We'll be back in plenty of time. Mm hmm. I think he sells used cars now. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. When have, have you ever disappointed yourself? I, I, I don't, you know, you don't have to tell us something you'd, you'd be too embarrassed about, but did you ever disappoint yourself? Did you ever get to a test that you were not ready for and just blew it, needed to be prepared for that? I'm the only one who ever disappointed themselves in high school? Really? Yes, Jimmy, thank you for saving me, making me feel less like a failure. Oh, my. Yes, yes. Uh, Jimmy had a, had a, a good friend in their senior year in high school um, that he uh, didn't get the chance to share the gospel as much as he would have liked to have. And she hadn't obeyed the gospel when she was killed in a car wreck that summer. You know, and uh, I can tell the same story. I can tell the same story. In fact, the young lady that was killed in a car wreck that I never spoke to. I knew her well, you know. She was everybody knew her in class. She had a family member who had just obeyed the gospel uh, at college, and I had an opening and didn't use it. So I, I can understand that those are lost opportunities, aren't they? Yeah. Whenever you have someone that you might have shared Jesus with, and you miss that, those those hurt. Those hurt. Those really disappoint ourselves. And of course, Peter understands exactly what we're talking about. Let's begin reading in verse 17, and I'll have a few questions for you. I want you all to teach class instead of me. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 17, and I know this is some territory you've covered a little bit last week. Matthew chapter 26. By the way, Wednesday night, we will conclude our study as best we can on the book of Matthew. Uh, we needed a fill-in lesson. It's just going to work out perfectly. So Matthew chapter, chapter 26, verse 17 begins. Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says the time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each one of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, You have said it. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they'd sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. What do you know about the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Why is it the Feast of Unleavened Bread? <coughs> Pardon me? Commemorating their flight from Egypt. Commemorating their flight from Egypt. Why no leaven? They didn't have time for it to rise. They didn't have time for it to rise. 
And so in commemoration of they were not to take the time to let their bread rise and cook it unleavened, in commemoration of that, what did they have to do every year when it came time for this feast? What did they do with their leaven? They had to throw it all out. It all had to go. <laughs> and so they couldn't make it with leaven. So that's the time that the Passover, is the first, the first uh, celebrated by necessity on that last plague, right? Yeah. And then every year afterwards, they celebrated the pe feast of the Passover. They missed a few years um, because Hezekiah had to reinstitute it. But um, virtually every year, and they, now they're back to celebrating it, and it's commemorating the death of the firstborn and the fact that God had pass, passed over them because of the blood of the Lamb. Why do you think Jesus was so secret about, about his arrangements for the Passover meal? For fear, of persecution. for fear of persecution. They're trying to kill him, aren't they? They've already decided to kill him since he raised Lazarus from the dead. In fact, they're trying to kill Lazarus too. So he's got to be secretive. He's so secretive, his own disciples don't know where they're going until he tells them where to go. It appears that the person who's going to host the meal doesn't know they're going to host the meal either. And yet Jesus, that, that's okay. Jesus had gotten a mule or a, gotten a donkey by miraculous means as well just a week before. So uh, this is, Jesus can do things this way. In what stages did Jesus reveal his betrayer? Did he just do it all at once? And saying, Judas did it. Judas is going to do it. The one who dips his hand with me. And here in Matthew, it's saying he's already dipped his hand with me. Now John, as we read John, we find out that that was... Well, first of all, that was prophesied in the Psalms. That he dipped his hand in the sop with me. But in, uh, um, here in Matthew... It's already occurred, but back in John, whenever the question goes on between Peter, Jesus is right next to John, and Peter's next to John, and Peter asks John, have him tell us who it is, and John, he tells John, it's the one who dips the sup with me, and Jesus actually dips the sup and gives it to Judas. And so he clearly identifies that, but also here we find out they all asked, is it me? And Judas, why does Judas ask, is it me? He knows it's him. Why is he asking? So he, looks like the rest of them. he wants to look like the rest of them. And it looks like Jesus answered him so subtly, so carefully. Judas knew exactly what he had to say, but none of the rest of them seemed to understand it. Because when he goes out, they don't get it. They don't understand. They think he's going to give something to the poor. So they don't get it. Um, uh, was Jesus warning Judas not to go through his, with his scheme? Or was he just warning him about what was going to happen when he did? The decision was already made. He had gained the money already. And the devil was already, already helping him out. So uh, this was already, the die was cast. But Jesus wanted to be sure everyone knew the consequences um, we're still on this passage. How do the, bre the bread and the fruit of the vine relate to body and blood? How are those fitting symbols? Yes. Those verses there are from Matthew. We're in Matthew chapter 26. And then the verse we're talking about, we see Jesus took the bread, verse 26. And then verse 27, he took the cup. Yes, chapter 26, verses 26 and 27 would be what we're talking about there. Okay, the purity of the, his body and the purity of the unleavened bread, there's no... Sin is often... Uh, in 1 Corinthians, actually, sin, it, it describes sin as leaven that they needed to leaven to pull out of the lump in chapter 5 when there's there an individual who is um, having his father's wife and that's got to end and so that person has got to be withdrawn from and 
Paul reminds them, don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? But it's the growth that's being talked about, pure or impure, because actually the church is described and its influence is described as leaven. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that's hidden in a lump of meal about growth. So leaven is neither good nor bad, but nine out of ten times it's bad in, in the scriptures. And there's no evil in Jesus. He's pure. He's pure. Why is bread and wine so good at symbolizing? They're everywhere. Every society has bread and wine of some kind. Some kind of, we, we love our fruit juices. We love that fruit of the vine. And every society does that. We've all figured that one out. And wherever you go in the world, your unleavened bread might be made with a rice flour or a coconut flour. Um, but it's going to, there is unleavened bread available. They're available. Most anywhere in the world, bread is considered the staff of life. Bread's the staff of life almost anywhere in the world. Yep. And somebody's got it somehow. It does. And does this mean you can't use uh, white grape juice like they do in Australia? I don't think the color is intended so much here. Um, but uh, the association between wine and blood is actually rife throughout the Old Testament. In fact, the, uh, that, how, uh, is it how or it's, who was the writer of the, uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic who took that, that popular tune, uh, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. Uh, Isaiah and other prophets view the guilt of Israel as a big vat of grapes and every sin is another grape being thrown in. And essentially the sinners are there in this vat of grapes and whenever it overflows and whenever it's full, when it's time, then the day of the Lord comes and the Lord gets in there and steps on the grapes and smashes Israel and smashes. And so um, that the vine, and in fact, the revelation will use this again uh, in this idea of the wine being the blood here of those who need to be punished. So Jesus' blood and wine going together just makes such sense. However, there's some big differences between the Passover and this. Um, of course, they both ate the bread, but what about the, the sacrifices, the blood of the covenant? Jesus says this is the blood of the covenant. What happened to the blood of the covenant the first time? Well, that was put on the house, and then a few weeks later, when they get to Mount Sinai, and they all say, yes, they hear the Ten Commandments, before they're put on stone, and they all say, yes, we'll do it, a sacrifice is made, and, the, and Moses says, this is the blood of the covenant, and he sprinkled the, law, the people with it. Are we sprinkled? Or do we take it in? We come on, it comes on in to us. We, we take this in. It's not just the outer sprinkling on us. We take that inside of us. It's a little different, isn't it? Um, the disciples are singing a final hymn together. You think it was a major or minor key? Oh, this wasn't happy birthday to you. It was happy birthday. You know, it was a, a this what must have been a sad time. But mu music's, uh, music's so flexible, isn't it? And singing is so flexible. We can express the greatest joy and the greatest sorrows. Through our singing. Sometimes it's hard to get through a sad song without crying yourself, isn't it? You ever have those? That, that, that's what broke me down when I lost Penny was one of her favorite sad country songs. I tried to sing along on the radio and uh, about had to pull over. You know, that just, that it, that it gets you, doesn't it? They can really get you. And I think this was, must have been a sad moment. Let's continue our, our reading here, verses 31 through 35. Then Jesus said to them all, to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, 
I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. What are the emotions and motives accompanying Jesus' next prediction about Jesus' vow? What are the emotions going on here? What are Jesus' emotions? He's got a. This is not a time of joy, that's for sure. Uh, Jesus knows what's about to happen, and so he cannot have a happy emotion here. I think he's probably very matter of fact. Probably very matter of fact about this. Is he predicting this to make Peter feel bad? No. He's strengthening Peter. Judas is left. There's nothing he can do for Judas, but he can help the rest of them. And he can help them come back. What's uh, Peter's promise? I'm never. I'll never do it. I'll never do it. And what's his follow-up vow? Even if I have to, even if I have to die with you, I'll do it. Was, was Peter ready to fulfill that vow? I believe he's going to use a sword. He tries, and that may be part of why he is so upset is the Lord doesn't allow him the chance to fight for him when he's ready to go. Um, but Peter's not the only one making this vow, is he? Everybody's making the same vow, and they've all got the same problem, every one of them. He's going to do it in a very special way and deny him three times, but it's his outspoken saying, I'm not going to do it, is why he gets the clear and so hurtful prediction. Jesus isn't trying to hurt him, but Jesus is making sure his strongest disciple comes back, his strongest disciple as well, even though he's most prone to these swings. Do you find people in your life like that? Do you have some mercurial people that they're the most loyal person you've ever had? They'll be on your side 100% and then you tick them off? Uh-oh, we're in trouble. Um, and Peter seems to have that, that a little difference in his personality sometimes. Verses 36 through 46. Then Jesus came with them to the, a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. They began to be sorrowful and, and deeply distressed. And he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it, be, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. What are the emotions Jesus must have been feeling in Gethsemane? Disappointment for one. Disappointment as he tries, as he has his disciples 
He takes his three most trusted. There must have been a feeling of dread. There's no way to face that kind of a painful death without dread. I would dread a beheading or a, a, a painless um, execution from modern times if they're able to make it painless. Nobody's come back and told us it was painless. You know, but uh, if they can, if they're going to give me a lethal injection, I'd still dread that. Much less this death of torture for hours on end. What did he ask his disciples? What did he ask them to do? Watch and pray. Watch and pray. What does it mean to watch? Okay, watch him pray, see him pray. He's, he's, they, they watch and they get the details, don't they? This is the only time we see Jesus on his face in prayer. Okay, they catch that detail. What else does it mean to watch, guys? If you stand watch, what are you doing? Judas has gone to betray him. They're on their way at any time. Of course, Jesus seems to know right as they're coming. But they're standing watch for Jesus. This is guarding as well as paying attention, as well as, uh, as seeing what he's doing. But what did he ask from, G from God? Let this cup pass if there's any other way. And yet, what is his prayer besides let this cup pass, it is, thy will be done. If I have to drink it, here Matthew makes it clear what that means, thy will be done. The others talk about, do not add this ex clear explanation of what it means, thy will be done. Here he says, if I have to drink it, I'll drink it. That, that, that's what he means by, thy will be done. Did Jesus get anything he asked for? He got the strength he needed to go to the cross. But as far as what he was asking for. He got, he got the answer. He, he got the answer to human kind of question. He got the answer he had to have. And I wouldn't want it either. Uh, what was God's will? He had to die for us. He had to die for us. He had to die for our sins. Uh, what's the model for prayers that Jesus gives us here? How, can we, how should we be copying what Jesus is doing in prayer? We got a, the model prayer is excellent to use any time. We should be praying for God's will. We should pray for God's will to be done in our lives. Pray multiple times. Don't stop. He says, let, his feelings be known. let your feelings be known to God. Pour it all out there. Put it all out there. Let God ex know exactly what you want. How, let him know and then be ready to accept his will. But Jesus poured it all out on his face in prayer. We don't even get on our knees. And he's on his face in prayer. And so what a, what a beautiful model Jesus is for prayer here, uh, especially whenever we're not going to get what we want. What are the obstacles that Jesus faced in prayer? Why is he out in the middle of this garden? The fact that he knows that his disciples are sleeping. Knows his disciples are sleeping. Why is he in the garden? I mean, the garden's a beautiful place, I, I presume. Why didn't he stay in the upper room and keep praying there? He needs that privacy. Where do you think that mob has been before they came to Gethsemane? Judas knew where that was. If he's going to have time for prayer, he's going to have to move on someplace else.
Okay, Judas knows the place he's praying, but Judas also knows where dinner was. And so Judas has got to, he's got to be betrayed. They've got to know where it is, but they don't have to get there right away. <laughs> and so it, it, it's, it's almost according, well, it is according to plan, isn't it? They're much more introspective here. They're, they're in the, uh, uh, a natural setting in God's place uh, much more than they are in a place of hospitality in the, this, this house. Uh, I want you to think about for a moment Jesus in prayer, even though we don't have time to go through all of that, how does he start his ministry? What does he do before he's baptized? For 40 days and 40 nights. He goes and fasts in the wilderness, and then he's going to be tempted by Satan. And Satan will be back again. Now, what, what prayer habit did Jesus have without his disciples over and over? Solitude. He'd go off on his own and he'd pray off. And by, what's the one exception where he just takes a few disciples and he goes off and, and prays? And there's an amazing mountaintop experience. The Mount of Transfiguration. And finally, Jesus takes them all here. They're all with him. And those same three are once again with him in the depth of the valley here. But Jesus' prayer life, they're finally seeing what he's been doing all this time in prayer. Um, I doubt that Jesus was this diswrought in prayer at any other time, of course. But uh, I think that's an interesting way to look at how Jesus taught us and his disciples to prayer, pray. What's the problem the disciples have? They're human. Jesus is just as human as they are. Why is Jesus able to stay awake and they're not? Discipline in prayer. They're tired. It's been a long way. It's been a long day. A lot of things have been going on. Um, and it, it, it's a feast day. A lot of, a lot of things have been happening. Um, Jesus is more aware of what's coming. I think Jesus is more aware of what's coming. Have you ever, have you ever known a little more of what's going to happen than someone else does and they're not worried than you are? Because you know, Jesus knows exactly what crucifixion is coming. He really knows it's coming. Are they, have they had some trouble believing Jesus about what he's had to say? I mean... Just minutes before they know he's going to rise, but they forgot that very quickly. They, they, they tend to forget things uh, quite often, quite quickly. They seem to forget the resurrection, for one, yes. That's right, it may just, let's, let's give the disciples a, a little bit of credit here. It may be just a human escape mechanism. Sleep is something we really need, and it helps us get away from some of the pressures and tensions. And we get to a certain point, and we're asleep. Now, there's enough anxiety, it can overcome that, and Jesus has that full weight of anxiety to keep him awake and praying. And... Uh, if they really understood what he was about to face, would they have stayed awake? Maybe. 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 Um, but it's interesting. Let's continue on, and the la we'll, this will be our last passage to complete. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he's the one, seize him. 
Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and cut the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. What kind of Messiah was the crowd expecting to arrest? Why'd they come with swords and clubs? They expected a fighter. They thought he was going to fight. How about Peter? Is his expectation really different than theirs? Not very. It's pretty much the same because it's all about violence. They're going to be, you know, kings have got to fight their wars. You've got to come to power some way, and it's almost always through violence. What did Jesus' response to Judas, the crowd, and his disciples show about the kind of Messiah he is? How did he respond first to Judas? First, it was do, you, do what you got to do, and now. He gets the kiss and he asks Judas, why are you here? Friend, why are you here? Because he was his friend. He was his friend. Haven't you been disappointed by a friend? Jesus washed Judas' feet right along with the rest of them. They couldn't figure out who it was. Jesus was still a friend to Judas. Judas is the one who wasn't being the friend of him. Um, how does he respond to the crowd? Is he done teaching? They're here to arrest him and he's still teaching them. This is what it said in the prophets. Do you th realize what you're doing? Do you see how little sense this makes? It had to be done because that's what the prophets said. He's preparing them for Pentecost. Even while they're trying to, to kill him. What kind of Messiah is Jesus? He's a forgiving one. He's one who wants to die for us. He, wants, he loves us. He's, he's ready to give, give up his life for our sins. Well, there will probably not be as much discussion as we go through the rest of this on Wednesday night. But I'm looking forward to it. There is a, we're going to, our speaker series will begin uh, a week from Wednesday. And, uh, but uh, we'll have Vacation Bible School Sunday through Tuesday. We'll still have class here Wednesday night. So we'll have plenty of material to discuss here beginning in Matthew chapter 26, verse 57. And as far through Matthew as we can go. So bring your seatbelts with you for Sunday. And strap it into that pew and, and we'll get there. God bless you. God bless you too. Amen.